Hello and welcome to Elevating Student Learning with an Inclusive Approach to Digital Materials, a Times Higher Education webinar held in partnership with Palego. I'm Ashton Wemborn, Branded Content Editor at THE, and I'm joined today by a panel of experts in the UK's higher education space. They are Liz Avery, Learning Designer at Coventry University Online, Rob Burton, Director of Digital Skills at Salford Business School at the University of Salford, Matt East, Senior Product Manager for Universities at Palego, Gina Fox, Deputy Dean of Education for the College of Social Sciences, Arts and Humanities at the University of Leicester, and Kate T. McNamara, Academic Support Manager for Library Services at the University of West London. So thank you very much to our panel for joining us and also to our audience. In today's ever-evolving digital learning landscape, technology presents a variety of solutions for breaking down barriers to engagement. In today's session, we'll discuss how institutions can leverage online resources to empower diverse learner cohorts. And the panel will also share their experiences of supporting students to reach their full potential by developing more inclusive and accessible learning environments. We'll also be taking questions from the audience throughout our session today. So please do submit your questions in the Q&A box, which you can see on your screen, and we will do our best to answer them as we go along. I think we're all here in a kind of knowledge sharing and learning capacity today. So again, if the audience would like to share any of your own case studies and experiences, then I think that we will find that a really useful um, addition to our conversation today. So um, please, please do jump in. Um, I think to begin our discussion today, I'd like to talk a little bit about the barriers that students face when engaging specifically with digital materials. Um, what are these barriers? How do they differ to the barriers that you might see with in-person materials? Um, I wonder, Liz, as learning designer for Coventry's online offering, if you can tell us a little bit about the specific challenges that you have noticed that come with designing a digital first curriculum. A lot of the challenges that we have are that um, learners sometimes, they are not aware of the fact that it's better to use um, a laptop than a smaller screen so we try and encourage um, our learners to make use of loan laptops um, to um, work out their time management so that they can uh, find time to go into campus um, and we also do a lot of work to signpost them to resources that they might find useful um, like extensions for their browsers um, that might help with things like text to speech um, and we do a lot of signposting to resources in the library as well um, we really try and provide that information at point of need and as a learning designer when we're creating our courses we do research and we create um, personas and we make sure that when we're developing the course, we're meeting the needs of the students that would be taking the course, as well as um, fulfilling the learning outcomes and um, being mindful of the skills that are needed um, for the assessment. You mentioned there the kind of um, hardware that students are using and the availability of loan laptops, um, which I think a lot of institutions are offering. But do you think that there are one of those barriers is possibly that access to hardware, even if those sorts of loans are available, are all the students that need them receiving them? I don't know if that's something that the rest of the panel have kind of come up against. I think sometimes it's just one of the things that we've, we're really working on at the moment is encouraging students to actually ask for help, you know, whether that's, you know, from um, a practical point of view to just accessing our um, you know the various support um, departments that we have um, so we've recently um, redeveloped our sort of undergraduate VLE structure and as part of that and the launch we've been really working on signposting students to support and um, scheduling in sessions so that students are more aware of the support that's available, but really underlining for them the fact that it is okay to ask for support, the support is there. So we found it's more 
the, the issue has been that students not realising that the support was there in the first place, then not having enough equipment to go around, if that makes sense. It'd like, be interesting to see what, what other people have found in that regard. Yeah, and um, Gina, I don't know if you wanted to jump in there, but it, it's interesting also to hear that that, I mean, is that kind of a self-reporting model that you're um, letting students come to you for help? Or are there those sort of checkpoints in place that identify the barriers before or, or at kind of a relevant time for someone to jump in and, and bring that student support? Yeah, so I, I totally agree with you, Liz. I think there's there's so much help available and sometimes students are just a little bit more reluctant. Maybe it's because they're first year, maybe because they're just not confident coming forward. So I think the more signposting that's available, the better. But also those reminders, those emails, those uh, visibility of different kind of support on campus. Um, and I think, as you said there um, as well, Ashton, about um, the, the temperature checks and, and, and having little moments to, to reach out to students and say, like, did you know this is available, whether it's uh, halfway through a module or maybe two or three weeks into a module to say, how are you, how are you getting on? Are you able to access the online reading list or are you able to uh, navigate your, your way through um, a source online? And because I think that's the thing as well. Sometimes we assume we've, we've put up, up everything onto our virtual learning environment and sometimes we just assume our job is done. Um, but actually, we've got students who don't really know what to do next um so having those guides having those tutorial webinars um those check-ins those surgeries whatever you want to call them to say right, right let, let me let me know how you're getting on and let's have a look at your how much you're engaging in the content and do you know when you look at a web page what you're meant to be looking for or when you look at a really long article how to actually get through that article and how to find out what's the most useful and relevant part for you because as we know there's so many so many sources online but often we kind of just let them go into the wild and then it's like well how, how do you how do you get the information that's really useful um so even if it's like really quick and easy tips like how to get the defined toolbar up to find a word like i was teaching uh, penology this morning and i was just saying like if you literally just go find central or command whatever and look for the word comparative, then you're literally drawn to that section. The rest might not be that relevant. You can scan through it, but this is the section that you need. So I think it's outlining support, but also trying to figure out whether or not that support is landing with students. And if not, then what do you do? Yeah, we often try and provide that support at point of need in our courses as well. And Again, you know, as a learning designer, the idea is not that we just design the course and leave it there. We, we, we have to remain invested in the life cycle of the course. And one of the things that we do with academics when we're developing our courses is to build in um, those checkpoints and those touch points on a regular basis. Um, like really short surveys to for the students or quizzes to find out have they grasped a point or not are they struggling with anything with accessing anything and getting students to think in that meta way about how their learning's going and then if it's a if it's relevant how are they sort of coping with a particular tool and the other thing that we use we do have analytics which show us which you know what students are engaging with so for example if they are meant to be engaging in a certain text and we notice the you know very low numbers of visiting that page or engaging with it then it gives the um course uh, team an opportunity to to step in and do something about that rather than only finding out at, at the end for example and with these sorts of temperature checks that we've been talking about, um, Matt, I don't know if that's something that you have kind of seen. I, I suppose you've got access to a wider, more diverse set of case studies and data on that kind of um, system. So are there key moments that you think universities need to be really aware of, especially with these kind of new digital materials? And also we've spoken a bit about undergraduate students who are perhaps coming to this sort of way of learning for the very first time, um, yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot of a, a lot of individual points to pick up on there, and um, I think just to start off, going back to a point that Gina made about that kind of almost pre-arrival kind of um, benchmarking, um, 
some really good examples I've seen have come from CEDA, so it's the um, Education Development Association. Um, there's, a, there's a project I'd call out called Be Banger Ready from Banger University that's absolutely fantastic for um, pre-arrival benchmarking, helping universities and students identify um, some of those core literacies where students might need a little bit more support. So for anyone who's looking into that kind of thing, I would, I would really recommend that. Um, around sort of touch points within, within, within courses, I mean, I think there's, there's a consistent approach which is often taken across higher education, really around the kind of week six, week seven kind of period, like the reading week area of, of, a, of a sense check. Um, I think what I would say though, is that from my perspective, context is king, it's the most important thing. So you know, there's been reference to um, discipline variance um, throughout some of the conversation we've had so far. And I think that's really crucial actually, because, um, you know, there's a very different cyclical nature that can occur from, uh, you know, a STEM course, for example, to a humanities or a social science course. So having that kind of simple rule of thumb of, you know, week seven is the right week is not is not necessarily um, right, um, right for me, I would say. Um, if you don't mind, I'd just like to build on a couple of the other points that, that have been mentioned though, around, around barriers, because um, a lot of what's been talked about already kind of resonated with some research I was doing um, probably about 18 months ago, really. And we, we looked into what are the barriers to students in digital reading. And, I, and I'd kind of summarise this really into, I guess, into five or six different areas. Um, access and accessibility. So everything from students not being able to actually fundamentally access the digital resource for, for you know, password reasons or issues around digital literacy, accessibility, content fundamentally being inaccessible. Um, environment. Students not necessarily knowing um, what good practice looks like for a digital reading space, but so students actually operating in a um, in a reading environment that is is healthy and beneficial to them. Um, that expanded for me onto practice and literacy. I think we as a sector talk a lot about literacies at the moment, particularly for first year students, but that extends into you know in, into later years, as, as Liz was mentioning. One literacy that we don't talk about a lot is actually reading literacies um, and the fact that, um, you know, we do have to work with undergraduate students in particular to actually really understand how to fundamentally engage with different resource types. You know, we don't all just read textbooks. We have students who get engaging with primary and secondary sources, with journals. They may not have done this before. And but one of the one of the big areas that came out from my research is that we essentially have to help students unlearn some of their practice when it comes to entering or transitioning into higher education. I think that's a really big challenge that I've not necessarily seen anyone crack. I can't point at a university and say they've, they've done this brilliantly, but it feels like a, a fairly perennial problem to me that, that higher education hasn't really figured out yet. And it's something that I think is particularly interesting. And th there's great examples coming from um, Primarily online online environments like Coventry Uni, like UCEM, like the Open University, but this this has not kind of proliferated everywhere yet. Um, and the final the final area that that really jumped out to me was actually technological. So it's all the points that were just mentioned around device access, um, even down to things like interoperability. You know, is 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 the resource that I'm being presented with actually accessible from the device that I'm on? Um, but I think that comes with that brings affordance as well. So you know, there's a huge amount of opportunity to really help students engage in a, in a much deeper level when it comes to technology. And I'm sure we'll talk about that later on. But out of all of those points, that is one area where I think there's a really um, great opportunity as well as the challenge that comes from that. And that's that's the technology point, which I'm sure we'll talk about. I'd also like to just jump on the idea of unlearning. I suppose. Unlearning is probably at the bottom of the list for, um, you know, mm. teaching spaces. It perhaps seems counterintuitive in a few ways, but but as materials change around students and teachers, then, as Matt has said, the way that um, we need to be engaging with those materials changes. And so I suppose there are specific new skills that students need to be equipped with when they join a higher education space. Um, I wonder if that's something that you as a panel have seen, have noticed kind of people coming up into the higher education space and thinking we're getting a lot of people coming in here and they're actually lacking these key competencies that are going to make their learning much more effective. Um, I suppose I'm looking at Rob here in terms of 
Um, I know that your job title involves um, digital skills. So are you kind of seeing a pattern of um, lacking skills, I suppose, or, or things that need to be unlearned? And how are you tackling that? Yeah, um, thank you, Ashton. I, I, I was about to jump in anyway on that. And I, I think there's some, Matt makes a really interesting point, and um, I'm, I'm not sure whether it's about unlearning, but I think there's there's a risk that we can we can make some assumptions about the skills that that students, undergraduates, and even postgraduate students are are coming to us with, whether that's digital skills or um, kind of broader academic skills around reading and, and crit critically engaging with with texts of, of of all forms, and I think it's. Uh, it's really important that we that we think about scaffolding the, the support around and, and and not making assumptions so that we start out kind of making it, it it clear through our communication through how we what we post in terms of our online resources how we communicate in in the classroom settings and all the other spaces around around the university uh, to to enable students to kind of engage and learn how kind of I guess how we expect them to behave and what's uh, what's appropriate in terms of the sorts of texts and, and, and resources that they use and, and why they're appropriate and what's and what's not not appropriate. And I think we've got opportunities to do that on a number of um, on a number of different levels. Obviously through through the online learning platforms and the, the, the resources that we can build around that through through our, our, our libraries, both as a physical and as a, a virtual space. The staff that are working with the students, and that's not necessarily just the academic staff, but the way that we can engage with the student body through um, whether it's it, it's course reps or or peer mentors, and in my experience, one of the things that has worked really successfully has been the use of peer mentors that, that who are, who are at level five or at level six who are supporting delivery, whether that's at level three or level four, and and giving students the opportunity to to ask the questions that they perhaps wouldn't of of their lecturer around of about how, how to reference or is this text one that I, sh I should use or not. So I, I think um, we do need to be very mindful of how the skills that students are coming to us with uh, and, and we can make assumptions about the amount of um, time that they may spend engaging in tech, but it's different, different uses of technology. And we want them to learn to use the technology in a way that is academically sound and also is building their, their, their skill sets to make them um, to enable them to to be successful through the through their degree program but also as they exit from the university into the world of work it's about building that that rounded skill set both digital and um kind of broader academic and we need to do that through various various different kind of touch points but in a way that enables us not for the students not to fall through the net and that's a danger if you've got multiple touch points how how you stop somebody falling through i'm not sure whether that really kind of answers your question but it it I think it's important that we do not make assumptions about the skill set that students come with and we we support their the development of of the appropriate skills all the way through the course from kind of fundamental skills in first first year through to kind of higher order skills as they um as they progress through their courses. Yeah, and sorry, Dina, please do jump in. Um no, I was just gonna say I totally agree with you, Rob, and I think um, and I think that that support, we, I think sometimes we do forget, and it kind of relates to your point, Matt, where we, we, we think about all the students and what they need, but then we forget that actually it's the staff that's going to help do this and help make it as accessible as, as accessible as possible. So given staff the support to say, right, these are the barriers and these are the things that you can do in order to break down those barriers and make things as accessible as possible. So we've kind of skirted around the, the support around staff, but I think that's really, really key here. And, and, and given our colleagues that kind of, that information, the, gu the guidance and the help or the, the training, the support packages, the manuals that we've been talking about, um, for them to then go on to, to carry that out and, and to make students um, make their life a little bit easier as well. But then there's just one other point that I thought um, it might be worth mentioning and see what the rest of uh, the panel think as well. And I think one of the other barriers with engaging with online texts and online material is that lack of engagement that they're used to or maybe were used to in the past. And and it, it kind of um, it kind of um, 
links into one of your points, Liz, that you men mentioned earlier about being on campus. And I think sometimes we think that just because you're engaging with a, a text online means that you're in your room with the door shut and you're concentrating and nobody's just disturbing you, which is not, not true at all. And so I think it's about allowing or creating activities that are actually group focused or collaborations around online text and that can be a really good way of breaking down the barriers as well so you're looking at this text that you've been told that you have to read by next week you've no idea what it's about you've read it three times you still don't know it makes no sense and so let's get together let's work it through you look at paragraph one you look at paragraph two let's summarize the text or you look at that article i'll look at article three four five let's get the summaries together let's stick it on a padlet and then everybody has access so we're breaking down that massive overwhelming reading list that none of us are going to do let's be honest and everybody does a little bit take responsibility for that little bit and then everybody can access the benefits and reap the benefits so it's i think about trying to allow and think creatively about bringing around interactions on on online text and whether that's either book clubs or digital book clubs or um another great one is a podcast series and allowing students to record them as well but yeah just thinking creatively around making it more interactive if possible i think that's a a good, a good way to break down those barriers. Actually, if I could come back on a couple of points that Jean's just made, um, <clears throat> I think one of the tendencies that I've observed across across particularly UK higher education is almost the assumption that the academic is going to have the answer to absolutely everything. And actually, there is a huge amount of um, vast knowledge across the across universities that can really help with students. Um, you know, students developing these skills, particularly in areas like the library. Um, and one of the things that really emerged from the research I referenced previously was where, li the, what, where librarians were deeply integrated directly into courses, particularly in the first year, to cover things like key skills, key literacies, and that kind of thing that were very uh, discipline focused as well. That had a, that was seen to have a really positive in, um, impact on um, you know everything from reading literacy so we were talking about information skills you know engaging with text like Jean was just mentioning um and i actually just wanted to make reference to to build a bit on what on what Jean was just talking about there um another great example i've seen on i guess collaborative reading um more broadly is a project that emerged from um Solent university i'll share a, a link to a book chapter later on and they did exactly what Jean's just described rather than um attempting to get students to read you know, a whole journal article, for example, in their first year independently, actually breaking down into, into sections that each student then read, created a summary, peer reviewed as a group. So there was a collective understanding of that, of that article. That works really well in things like journal, in journal, um, in reading journals, and particularly in some STEM subjects where students may not have as much experience reading that kind of material. Um, I'll, I'll find a link in a moment and send that around. Just is this a good time, sorry, for me to declare my previous employer was Solent University? So you may remember we welcome the transparency. <laughs> sorry, Dina, were you jumping in there? Yeah, I, I was. Um, it was to build on that point, and now I've totally lost my train of thought. So yeah, I'll, it'll come back to me. Apologies. I think while you while you track down where your thinking was, um, we're speaking a little bit here about the role of libraries and the changing role of libraries. And I think we all know that libraries are no longer kind of um, quiet and solitary spaces in which to sit and read or research. Um, and I think especially as the role of the physical campus is changing, we've also kind of had this brought up in a question from the audience in terms of the, the physical environment in which students are studying. Um, and Matt has also brought up how beneficial integrating librarians very closely into certainly that kind of first year of learning, but I suppose throughout any any um, educational journey. And so I'd really like to, to kind of hear from Katie in terms of how you've seen the library space changing and what sort of things are students coming to libraries and librarians for now and what things have taken a bit of a back seat in that space? Yeah, um, yeah, it's, it has changed quite a lot. Um, I'm a subject librarian for the Film Radio and Design School, um, so that, that's kind of um, you know, who, I'm, who I'm supporting. Um, 
And I think that um, so many so many of these issues kind of relate a little bit to like the core aspects of librarianship, I suppose, in terms of like finding sources, evaluating sources, um, as well as kind of effective reading and kind of criticality. So it's kind of like like um, sort of timeless timeless challenges um, and kind of how you know, how can we use technology to to sort of overcome some of those. Um, I think that one of the things um, that I've sort of seen or noticed um, is that students sort of interact with digital um, sources in a slightly different way from before and that I think that like they access a range of sites that they're used to and that they're comfortable with and sort of commercial sites that they're familiar with um, and then kind of the look of those um, academic sites and kind of journals um, can sometimes be a little bit off-putting for them maybe it's because it's design students that I'm supporting um, but I think yeah that can be a bit off-putting and kind of almost like the lack of consistency I suppose across different platforms and um, they find a bit um, I don't know, there seems to be a freeze moment there where they're a little bit reluctant to engage with something. Um, and also, you know, from their perspective as well, there is a lack of consistency in terms of the features that are available, you know. Some of our ebooks have read aloud functionality on them, some of them don't, um, you know, so if that's something that they're looking for and expecting, um, it's not always going to be there for them. Um, and yeah, I think kind of like having, yeah, sort of like all, all of these different types of resources, um, I think it can feel a little bit overwhelming for them sometimes. Um, so yeah, perhaps there's some kind of like technological sort of AI things that we can kind of hope for in the future that will um that will sort of make that break that down a little bit and sort of make their learning a little bit a little bit easier to manage. Um in terms of the library space, um I think that we're, I mean, we're still offering sort of like the individual space, um, small group space, large group space, um, as we always have. Um I'd say like the 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 idea of the silent space is sort of like the most contentious bit in terms of it's it's difficult sometimes to keep it silent. Some people really want that silence. Um, some people don't, you know, like will will use a phone and be like, oh, it's quiet, so that is silent. So I think that kind of, um, yeah, there's there seems to be less of a kind of, um, I don't know, like people people don't seem to be as um, kind of I think there's a lot of different ideas about silent and what, and what that means and different workspaces um so yeah I think it can be it can be a little bit, bit of a challenge for students to to find somewhere to work that sort of matches exactly what what they would like um and I don't think we're quite there with with solving that to be honest at the moment um yeah, I don't know if other people have um experiences um of, of any things that they're offering um our kind of spaces um but yeah I've had the joy of working with a, a number of different libraries over the last probably 10 years now. And one of the big observations I've made is that that, that, that historical kind of um, positioning, I guess, that, that Katie was just talking about around, around the, you know, the silent space. I've seen a huge amount of diversity into, you know, actually establishing different environments for different ways of working. So libraries, um, as they move more into, for example, uh, digital resource collection, freeing up space within the physical environment and turning that into collaborative group environments for, for students to interact and engage with. Um, from a physical perspective, that's probably been the biggest change that I've observed over the last uh, yeah, five, 10 years, really. The fact that, that, you know, that the environment is now being redeveloped to be, I guess, multi-purpose. Um, and to support, you know, lots of different different requirements around independence and collaboration, and you know, and tactile learning and all that kind of stuff. No, I, I would uh, say that. Um, apologies for if I've been slightly flippant earlier on around, around the my um, link to uh, one of the institutions that you you mentioned, but I I, I think in a, in the universities that I have experience of, there's increasing pressures on the on the physical spaces that 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 they have and libraries are really important in there one of those spaces where there's perhaps there is some freeing up of space and opportunities to use that space um where students can come together because other spaces with, which may have been uh, used around the university seem to be more fully utilized and there's less opportunity just to, to nip in a spare seminar room because it's it's already booked it's already booked out so i think libraries are important because they provide that type of point where people can come can come together in an, in an environment where they I guess they feel they have access to learning materials but the opportunity to to interact um and yet my experiences in terms of the the move away from um large spaces open spaces where everyone's silent to kind of collaborative spaces and bookable pods um with um 
access to um, some of the kind of IT facilities that, that they might need are, are, are important for students as they as they come to meet uh, rather than just being sat in sat in kind of single rooms and interacting and interacting online. So I, th I think that it's important what you're saying. They are important spaces um, for, for the interaction where students can come together because there may not be as many spaces available to them as then there perhaps may have been some time ago in um, in more kind of traditionally set up universities which operate around just kind of lecture like seminar delivery. I think when we speak about um, digital tools, deliveries, materials, um, one of the real benefits of, of that is that it creates a diversity of materials and a diversity of ways that students can engage with their learning. And so that obviously in turn um, kind of encourages a diversity of cohorts. Um, and so I think those sorts of inclusive pathways, um, there's a moment that universities can really jump on to create learning environments that cater to a wider range of learners than ever before. So what sort of materials do you think that you've seen that have really hooked into this idea of of inclusion and access I know Matt mentioned earlier about um access being a, a huge part of the um changes that he's seen brought about through um digital delivery so yeah how does how does inclusion kind of fit into this conversation um is it okay for me to jump in on this one? yeah so, um from a learning design perspective, we tend not to start with the materials or the content first. So we operate within a framework, if you like. So we use um, a user centered or human design led um, approach. And when we're creating that learning experience for our students, um, we make sure that we adhere to things like multimedia um, learning principles like Clark and Maya. Um, they were the ones that, that sort of created these principles. Um, and it, it, thinking about also how we're supporting staff to create that experience. As learning designers, we think about the user experience, the learner experience. And we also think about service design, like the design of everything that is going to support the creation of that learning experience. So as we're, we, we work with sort of templates and frameworks, and then we make sure that we contextualize them. And a really big part of the design process is working on personas, finding out as much as we can about the students that are going to be taking our courses and making sure that these things are meaningful and we keep revisiting them and making sure they're valid. And really, when you're thinking at that higher level, you've got your framework in place. We've got quality assurance checklists that make sure that anything that we're doing when we do those checks, it aligns with learning design principles. It takes into account the needs, motivations, constraints of our users. Um, through that lens, you should automatically be creating courses that are inclusive. And as part of our framework, we make sure that we, we, we create this feedback loop. So we, we know how students are engaging. We know, we know we have regular touch points with academics who are delivering those courses. So they in turn you know, can have that dialogue with us as, as designers and then we work in a very collegiate and a very collaborative way to make sure everything hang, hangs together so um yeah so we don't necessarily start from the materials first and any technology that we employ we would apply you know we, we would make sure that that fits in with our procurement requirements and is you know within that checklist, it would, we would make sure that it's suitable for, for our students as, as well as for the context of, of the course. Yeah, I suppose um, it makes good sense to let the the people in the pedagogy lead those sort of um, learning design processes. And and I wonder if the rest of the panel, how closely you've been involved in that sort of design process and the things that you've seen perhaps kind of come in and out of the process materials that have and haven't worked and um the way that you flag when those when those systems are not working for you do you mind if i jump in on this just pulling on a couple of examples from across the sector um 
I think an area that I well, an area I find really interesting um, in, in in this kind of sphere is around getting student contribution to the resources that are relevant as well. And one of the one of the most powerful um, activities, I guess you could say, that, that can be applied in in multiple disciplines and multiple scenarios is actually around crowdsourcing. Um, and so when we're talking about inclusivity, you know, that's a that's a, a pretty a pretty broad phrase. Um, and in, in some ways, there are different layers around inclusivity and, and I guess accessibility as well. Content can be fundamentally inaccessible to students for various reasons, um, not just you know, the, the physical um, access to that resource, but actually just their knowledge and understanding and uh, interpretation of content can be, can be very varied as well. And one of the reasons why I'm, I'm advocating for taking crowdsourcing as an activity is that it really, it can, if framed correctly, really encourage students to um, to, to lead on research, to, to lead on their own um, critical appraisal, critical analysis of resources from their own perspective, to bring in, and bring in a diversity of resources. Um, I think what's, what I, when I've seen this being really powerful is when, when academics have created activities around, you know, centered around a single resource or a, um, or a collection of resources, and have asked students to find alternative uh, perspectives, for example. Um, that could be alternative perspectives, alternative uh, voices, um, alternative media, um, alternative formats could be any, there's a number of different ways that you can slice that. Um, but the key thing there is actually around the critical appraisal as well. So students saying, why is this a good resource based on the outcomes that you know we're, we're trying to achieve? Um, the reason why I really love that though, is that then students basically are able to build up a bibliography, a collaborative bibliography of resources that they can draw on when writing assignments, academics can diversify their content for the next next semester I, I just, I'm, I'm if you haven't picked up on it I'm totally sold on that as a as, as an activity because I just think it works in so many different formats and is fundamentally inclusive we um, use a similar activity in one of our entrepreneurship courses where we we're getting students to create their own sort of boards that were linked to the project that they were going to be doing for their entrepreneurship assessment and like I said again it's it helps students to see themselves in the, in their course and like you say it can bring up fresh ideas which then you know can can be taken forward in, into the next um cohorts as well it was it was something that i experienced as a student when i was doing my mba um, and we were you know we were pulling i had a cohort of, of of peers from working in higher education working in executive leadership working in tech working in mechanics um, you know, it was a, it was sorry, automotive. I should say it was a huge array. But being able to pull in different examples, particularly around things like um, organisational behaviour and that kind of thing, was was really valuable to, it, as it really helped um, remove the narrowness of my opinion. I guess I would say, and I've seen I've seen that time and time again in both undergraduate and postgraduate study. So yeah, I advocate for it. Is it okay if I? jump in here too so yeah I, I totally agree with everything you've both said and um, I think like um, it was said at the beginning it does require a certain amount of intentionality doesn't it I, I think you need to be very aware uh, and to make every possible um, opportunity count really and I think yes bringing in the students is one way and it, it can be really advantageous on many many different layers and one of the things I was going to say earlier I've eventually remembered was to do with the credibility of those sources and this can be another opportunity to kind of get an idea as to what students are where, where they're getting their information from and how credible those sources are and then to help teach them how to choose trustworthy sources think about the agenda that might be behind them the origins the the, the authors whether or not they're peer-reviewed and we, we throw that that phrase around a lot and I'm, I'm very conscious of terminology like that and especially with maybe undergraduates and as uh, I think Rob said earlier even postgrads where you talk about peer-reviewed material what the hell does that mean to to a student um, do they understand what what that actually entails so I think again it's about Bringing, going underneath the the skin and trying to figure out what what where is their understanding here and how can I improve on that? So I think that intentionality is very very important there, and I think it can even go further. And um, the, the diverse materials, the inclusive pathways, can go further to not only 
refer to um, texts or, uh, or sources in that respect, but maybe even assessments and making assessments as diverse as possible. And I've tried this a few times. Um, and one of the modules I teach uh, or I did teach um, was terrorism. And I, I give students the opportunity to, to, to choose which kind of assessment do you want? And let's have a, uh, have a little think about the weighting of the assessments as well. And do you think it should be 60, 40? And where, where are you better at presenting? Maybe we can put the 60 and the presenting element of the assessment. So again, giving them kind of an opportunity, a voice, some kind of control over their learning. Um, and that will really help. And that I did find that really helped with how invested the students were then in the whole process and felt like they had ownership. It was their course. It was their year on that course. And they made some choices as well. Um, but also then I think some of the kind of quick wins, if you like, in relation to this, if I dare to say such a thing, quick wins. Um, is to do with the text that we, we do use. And even being really clear um, to students when we're referring to a source, who, who that source is, saying a surname, doesn't mean anything to a lot of our students. So like saying this is a certain person and they're from this area and they're from that background, to give them a bit of an idea, often we just assume they're men. Are they all men? Surely not. So like, I think again, it's about breaking down those barriers and again, and it, it reminds us, who, who are we including in our, in our lecture material? Is it all men from um, middle class working or where, 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 where are these sources coming from? Uh, and then you've got your, your other kind of ways of doing, um, of bringing in diverse material with your guest lecturers and, and that sort of thing. Um, but also um, bringing in videos and films and TED Talks, all that sort of thing. Students love that interaction. And again, being very aware, I was showing a video this morning on a, 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 a prison in Thailand and how dramatized and sensationalized the video was. So again, yes, getting some points across, but again, reflecting on the credibility of some of those materials as well. I think this has become more than ever, hasn't it? Um, you know, we, we live in a world of misinformation, disinformation, you know, we're, we're seeing, we've done really well to not talk about AI too much, but I'm going to say it now, um, you know, we are seeing, um, you know, a, a real proliferation of, 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 of misinformation, of hallucinations through the wider use of AI, particularly around imagery, but more, you know, more and more through video and that kind of thing, you know, the, the risk of propaganda, um, proliferating without critical appraisal across higher education is is real um and i think you know that that adds even more weight to really focusing on 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 the core literacies and now we can throw another one in which is ai literacies um but you know more than ever we need to be thinking about this from throughout the whole student journey as well otherwise we are going to be setting our students up to fail when it comes to appraising actually identifying the the relevance and the um, the quality of, of, of resources they're citing and they're using in their learning. Okay, if I just jump in on, on that point. So a lot of people have been talking about consistency and, and, and quality. And I think another issue that we have when we're creating these learning experiences is that tension between curation and creation. And it, it takes a lot of time to create a meaningful and effective online learning experience. And one of the, the projects we, we have going on at the moment at Coventry is to try and centralise um, the management of our digital, digital assets um, in a content management system. Um, and this would you know, allow us to have a, a, a repository of very good high quality materials. And then obviously you can develop an approval process, an upload process, and make sure you have the relevant metadata attached to those assets. And that means that we can get to a point where when we're working with our academics to create these learning experiences, they can search and they can find like really good high quality assets, you know, crisp pictures, you know, where the, the, the tone of voice is appropriate, et cetera. And then they can take those assets and contextualize them for the needs of the students and for the needs of their courses and like you say then that again is is showing students what good looks like what high quality looks like what inclusive materials looks like as well as you know giving people the opportunity to to then take those assets and redevelop them into different versions and then tag them you know according to the you know the different um scenarios in which they could be used so i think 
And, and a lot of this is about reducing the burden on academics, thinking about them as you know being part of that service design, helping reduce the cognitive load of the people that are creating these courses, and hopefully then make course creation something that they really enjoy because then they can take these materials, contextualize them. Hopefully, you know, they might have time to create some more original content on, on top of that. So, you know, we're really trying to think about this in a very systemic way, like how do you support the students, how do you support the staff? And I think that sort of, you know, in some ways that centralized approach, it can lessen that burden. You know, so we, we're not going to have like a thousand versions of Maslow's hierarchies of needs floating around the university, taking up space on the servers. And, and then there's that environmental cost as well. So if you're if you're effectively managing those digital assets, you could actually save money and it's better for the environment as well. You know, if you if you're thinking about it in that way as well. If I if I may, can I ask a question to the panel on this? Um, that's that's quite very relevant to what you were just referring to, actually, Liz. But an area that I'm quite interested in is how can we help um, remove some of the burden around discovering similarity? And by similarity, I don't mean plagiarism protection. I mean relevant resources that are applicable to, for example, a chapter of a book. Um, and the reason I'm asking the question is, with Palego, we we're, we're essentially an online library. We have 1.1 million books um, that are completely available on limited access to, you know, to users across the university. And one of the things that we, we have been talking about in this session, and I think is really relevant to Palego, is how we can help students create connections between that book and the 50 others that are relevant to the subject matter, but maybe from a different, a different audience, a different voice, a different perspective. Now, I'd be really interested to hear where you think the boundary would be between um, removing the, 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 the need for sense making between those different resources for academics and students um, and actually just lift, doing some of the heavy lifting because there, there is a real tension from my perspective of, of signposting too much and removing that academic agency um, but, but, and finding that midpoint I think is really, really important. And I mean, based particularly on, Liz, on what you were just describing, I wonder if you've got any thoughts on that. It's a big question, apologies. <laughs> no, that's, that's fine. I, I think a lot of it is about mo modeling behavior and, and going back to scaffolding again. So, and, and also thinking about, you know, those the specific skills that you want your students to learn and, and being very transparent with students about the value of it. We're having a lot of discussions at the moment. I'm in an AI focus group um, at my university and, one of the discussions we've had is, you know, that yes, it might be great to save time to, to come up with templates, to come up with summaries, but what is the cognitive cost of that? What is the cognitive cost of taking those shortcuts? And we've come up with this phrase, satnav syndrome. So it's almost like, well, if I'm not engaging my brain, I'm literally just like putting the, the location in and I get to it, then I'm not learning how to find my way there and I'm not going through like the processing depth is very shallow and there are times when that doesn't matter so again it can depend on the context it might not it might not matter that I've skipped those cognitive steps but there are times when it will matter and I think essentially that you know sometimes people say oh AI is going to be so great because then we won't have to cope with like blank page syndrome but you need to make an effort in order to learn something. You're literally building neural pathways in your brain and that takes effort and it takes energy. And so if you're not going through those steps and you're just skipping through it, you, you won't have gone through that process and, and maybe those neural pathways won't be as strong as they would have been otherwise. But it's all about the context and, and, and what, do you, what should the outcome be? And does it matter if you've gone through those steps or not? So... Yeah, that's quite a long answer to your to your to your question, but I think it's about thinking about scaffolding, being transparent with students about the value of you know putting in the effort, doing the hard work, making those connections. And for those that are struggling to do that, lots of examples to start with. So not giving them the whole of the the picture, but this is something we often do when I'm reviewing courses. I often recommend. Could you do a partially completed template? Could you show the students an example and then get them to do it themselves 
from a different perspective or in a different context. Can I jump in? Because I, I think uh, this sort of picks up on Matt's question and, and your response, but I think it's really, really important. It comes back to almost how we started out the, the discussion around digital literacy and understanding the the kind of the, the development of of skills and particularly if we're considering AI and the the part of part of the the challenge as we um, embrace AI in, in higher education is bringing students up to speed in terms of what's how to use the resource um, in in a critical way and not just as a way of shortcutting to to, to an answer because it, it can be a wonderful resource in terms of helping us identify potential sources but then we we still have to do the do the legwork in terms of engaging with those with those texts those resources to to kind of think about them critically to, to as you say to to do the learning so i think um and, and matt introduced the AI, but it, it presents both a, a fantastic opportunity but also an incredible challenge in terms of um developing students that are are aware of the, of the, the benefits but also the, the pitfalls and that's going to be a really important skill a literacy that, that students need to develop over the course of a program alongside kind of more fundamental digital skills um so yeah i, I think it's it is something that we we, we clearly get, are going to have to engage very carefully with but it does it potentially help us find lots of different sources that actually broaden broaden our mind before uh in terms of uh an area an area of, of study before we start to kind of close that close that down and just zone in on one particular kind of answer or solution i think that we've obviously identified ai as being one of those things that is going to fundamentally change the higher education space but you know a, a, it was going to touch all industries and so i think i'd like for the last few minutes of our conversation today to talk a little bit about the other um themes that you see starting to come up in higher education that are going to have to be addressed first by educators and then are going to have to be integrated into the student experience so you know these these broader trends that are going to start to shift higher education once again it's it's not a static industry and and the way that learners um what learners need and demand and what employers need and demand from graduates will will always change so I suppose my question is what happens next what do you anticipate your or um kind of the sector's response being to that um is there anything that our audience needs to be warned about coming through coming up the pipeline I guess one of the things that I suppose I'm very aware of all the time and I don't have the answer if anybody does that would be wonderful is the fact that we're trying to prepare students for a future that we don't really know what look what it looks like and for challenges that we can't even imagine what they are yet. Um, so I think the future, the future is very blurry uh, in, in that respect. And that's quite a challenge for um, educators to kind of take on. And it, it's really difficult. So I'm not saying that the soft skills that we are constantly trying to, 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 um, to teach our students, that communication, the teamwork and the flexibility, the resilience, all those kind of skills that are really, really important that we don't we don't stop doing them obviously but it's all, all also trying to think about other skills that maybe we're not even great at using uh, yet um, and need more work on um, but also like that um not being able to be as adaptable as possible and I think it it kind of if you look back at um, I don't know other people maybe uh, here present today me I, I've only ever done education I've only I've done my undergrad my MSc my PhD I worked in a chicken factory one summer that's about it um so I've always done this and my parents are the same they've always worked in the same thing but I think students now they, they kind of they, they chop and change they move around they they're they've got their hands in lots of different pots so I think it's about trying to develop our students so that they they can go on and, and continue doing that but be confident in doing that too and as well on the flip side of that it's about 
as well, like d digital technology is going to be key to that. Uh, and often I think we we almost expect our students to be really confident in using digital technology too, because they're the, they're the future. They were born into technology, if you like. So I think it's as well as uh, it's about recognizing that they may may not be as skilled as we assume they are, but we need to help continue um, developing their their digital technology skills and their resilience and their confidence and their ability to speak out and to to be brave and take risks. Um, when we're not necessarily doing that ourselves. So I think there's a bit of a juxtaposition there, but I think it's an important um, point, hopefully that other people, uh, maybe I'm the only one that thinks that that's important. <laughs> Please tell me if so. <laughs> um, but yeah. I, think I think that's really important. One of the things that I've realized, I, I have had quite a few different careers. You know, I was in teaching, then I went into administration, then I went into the software industry, and now I'm a learning designer. My job did not exist when I was finishing my my PGCE. Learning design as it is now was, was not a thing. Uh, I think what we can do, it, it, even though things are changing at a very rapid pace, is to equip students with mental models and frameworks that they can use in any situation and they can contextualize and and for me my the mental model which really you know i use all the time is this human-centered design model the approach and the principles and that's what i learned when i was working for sap in the software industry and then when i came back into higher education i was like hang on a moment like this works in this context so it's like this light bulb moment and a, a key thing is also metacognition. So my colleagues always laugh when I say that, that's like one of my sort of buzzwords, mm -hmm. but it is so important, the ability to kind of look outside into yourself and observe kind of what you're doing and what changes you might need to, to make. So getting a sense of that distance. Um, and at the same time, I think we really need to provide spaces of psychological safety for our students to help them practice failing um, in a safe way, you know, in a way that they might not experience outside or, or in their career. So it's helping them to practice, apply these models, contextualize them, learning skills like horizon scanning. And again, coming, coming back to quality, like, like Matt was saying, and you know, being able to use their skills to analyze, you know, who to follow on LinkedIn, who's the, the sort of, who should I follow to go down this particular career path? What journal and news articles are speaking sense about whatever topic I'm interested in? How do I know that or, or not? So it's this combination of thinking of, you know, um, high level frameworks and a space of psychological safety to help them practice that and learn and develop their confidence before they go into a career that, which might not even exist now, but it will in five years time. Yeah, I really agree with you on that, Liz, and particularly the part about um, students failing and kind of that is a, it's something that I see a reluctance for them to sort of try and because they, because they don't want to fail. Um, I think like from a library perspective, one of the main challenges um, for our sector is around kind of publishers and uh, the, the diversity really of um, of authorship and of um, kind of information that's that's available because I think that students aren't necessarily seeing themselves represented um, in the information that's being published and um, yeah kind of that I think can make it more difficult to to engage with so I think that even with all of these sort of like you know potentially uh, technological solutions to some of the problems um, without that without that representation um, it's not really going to work so yeah that's kind of one of the things that um, that I'm thinking about and that we're thinking about University of West London a lot at the moment. I can't disagree with anything that's been said there, really. Um, I think for me, there's a real challenge around graduate attributes because, you know, the OFS are measuring us on graduate attributes. Um, you know, something that's always under consideration is something that's always changing, as has been, has been described. And I think that there are a number of key skills that are, are ever evolving that are just not commonplace on some degrees um, and need to be and i'll give an example of i don't know, data analysis for example uh working with big data machine learning those kind of things these are the types of skills that are going to become crucial actually for 
many across the world in in the next five, 10, 15 years, and they already are, to be to be quite honest. Um, and actually, you know, universities teaching teaching core competencies that are off portfolio, I think, is really um, is where it exists is often in a module that's kind of key skills and there might be a couple of weeks that are relevant to off portfolio skills um i think that's going to have to change and you know there's been there's been, I, i've seen a cyclical conversation around the sector over the years um of the role of university and you know do do we is the role of university to leave with a degree or is it to leave with a with a with a broad range of skills that um you know allow you to um you know, achieve your full potential or broader potential as you as you expand into a career um and that that i think we're still in that conversation and we will continue to be um you also asked though ashton about um you know the, the challenge that universities are facing rather than kind of individual learners or, or academics i think one that we still haven't really cracked is actually um the change in modality that we're experiencing now so you know we've we've obviously you know, through the pandemic we moved into this emergency online teaching um you know universities have been slowly trying to come back to campus universities have also been expanding out their online portfolio um you know as Liz will be you know hugely familiar with but I think there's this really interesting challenge where what does the face-to-face -face lecture look like now and you know for for many years for many many years I did my undergrad in 2006 and uh Blended learning was was the norm then, you know. But now we're in this world of hybrid learning. Um, but the the student expectation and the, the the digital experience still hasn't necessarily transitioned into a true kind of hybrid modality. We're still kind of trying to do both and and really struggling with 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 appeasing all parties in that area. Um, I do think that there does need to be a kind of sector wide sense check really on what does you know what does face to face actually mean and what does the student experience actually look like that in that environment and that touches everything from how we teach how we create communities of practice the systems that we use the resources that we prioritize you know the physical environments that we create um where those physical environments are as well um Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Um, I am yet to see an institution that has, has has nailed that. But if anyone in the in the uh, in the audience has, please comment. Thank you very much, Matt. It's um, I think we could have spoken about this all day, which is probably exemplified by the fact that we've run over by a couple of minutes there. So um, I think that is going to bring us to the end of our conversation today. But I would just like to thank all of our panelists again for joining us. I think you've shared some some really interesting um, experiences and so raised some questions that I hope that we can continue to think about and, and hopefully check in and, and see how this progresses. Um, I'd like to thank our audience again for staying with us and, and engaging too. Um, there will be an on-demand video of the session which will be available in the coming days so please do keep an eye out for that but for now I will just say thank you again um, and we hope to see you at future THE events. <laughs>